Thank you for tuning in to RTM Nation Online, where we believe that you will receive the abundance of peace, prosperity, security, stability, health, healing, and truth. If you would like to learn more about the ministry, click the link below. Also, don't forget to subscribe to the channel. Now let's get into the message. We're going to start off with two quick images on screen. The first one you're very well familiar with, the second one as well, but let's do our Bible confession. Ready? Read. This is my Bible. I can be what it says I can be. I can do what it says I can do. I can have what it says I can have. Every verse is God breathed, and I aim to live by every word. It is essential to my faith foundation and works to change me from the inside out into the person God created me to be. That is why I shall never let it go. It is reliable. It is the truth. It is divine. It is the word of God and shall forever be to me my Bible. In Jesus' name, amen. The second image that we have for you is one that you're very familiar with. And for those who are listening to, the, to us on audio, imagine a picture of a ground. And in that ground, that ground is our spiritual foundation. It has certain things in the ground that help to make it strong, to help to make it firm. Those elements are the Bible itself, God, Jesus, the Holy Spirit, and the kingdom of God. The better understanding and grasp that we have of those things, it helps us stand more firm as Christians. We have spent a long time, family, a large part of this year working on our spiritual foundation, and we will continue to do so. We will continue to do so because, well, it's just necessary. And we will continue to do so for years. When you think about your foundation, the foundation always has a little time for maintenance. Every foundation develops cracks and needs a little TLC from time to time, and we will continue to do that. However, after today, we're going to move our discussion, what we could say, above ground. And I believe that you are in a good position for us to make that move. And by the end of this session, I'll make sure I explain to you why I have that belief. But for now, turn to Exodus chapter 3 in the NIV Bible. This chapter of the Bible contains the account that's best known as Moses and the burning bush. As a brief sort of lead in, when Joseph was alive, Joseph had a good relationship with the Pharaoh at the time. And because of that good relationship, the children of Israel, they had peace in Egypt and they prospered there. Eventually, of course, Joseph, he transitions. He dies. And a new pharaoh rises up. That new pharaoh looks around and he sees the large population of Hebrew people, and he begins to fear that they're going to rise up and overthrow his kingdom. So he devises a plan, a plan to enslave them. Now, he also had as part of his plan that he told the midwives that if you see a Hebrew woman giving birth to a male child, I want you to kill that child. The whole purpose of that was to make sure he would eliminate the spread of any Hebrew seed. However, what does God do? Well, God, he kind of saves, not kind of, he saves Moses. He saves Moses by a unique series of events. He takes the little baby Moses and he basically literally floats him on the river. And there, he basically falls into the welcoming arms of Pharaoh's daughter. Moses grows up in Pharaoh's house until one day he kills a man. And then he flees to a place called Midian. Over a period of time, God comes down to Midian and talks with Moses. And this is where we jump into the story. Starting in Exodus chapter 3, verse 1. We're going to read through the entire chapter. Here we go. Now Moses was tending the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian, and he held and he led the flock to the far side of the wilderness and came to Horeb, the mountain of God. There the angel of the Lord appeared to him in flames of fire from within a bush. Moses saw that the bush was on fire. It did not burn up. 
that though the bush was on fire, it did not burn up. So Moses thought, I will go over and see this strange sight, why the bush does not burn up. When the Lord saw that he had gone over to look, God called to him from within the bush, Moses, Moses, and Moses said, here I am. Do not come any closer, God said. Take off your sandals for the place where you are standing is holy ground. Then he said, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. And this Moses, and at this, Moses hid his face because he was afraid to look at God. The Lord said, I have indeed seen the misery of my people in Egypt. I have heard them crying out because of their slave drivers, and I am concerned about their suffering. So I have come down to rescue them from the hand of the Egyptians and to bring them up out of that land into a good and spacious land, a land flowing with milk and honey, the home of the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Amorites, the Parasites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites. Whew. And now the cry of the Israelites has reached me, and I have seen the way the Egyptians are oppressing them. So now go, I am sending you to Pharaoh to bring my people, the Israelites, out of Egypt. But Moses said to God, who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the Israelites out of Egypt? And God said, I will be with you, and this will be the sign to you that, is, that it is I who sent you. When you have brought the people out of Egypt, you will worship God on this mountain. Moses said to God, suppose I go to the Israelites and say to them, the God of your fathers has sent me to you, and they ask me, what is his name? Then what shall I tell them? God said to Moses, I am who I am. That is what you are to say to the Israelites. I am has sent me to you. God also said to Moses, say to the Israelites, the Lord, the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob has sent me to you. This is my name forever. The name you shall call me for, from generation to generation. Go assemble the elders of Israel and say to them, The Lord, the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, appeared to me and said, I have watched over you and have seen what has, what has been done to you in Egypt. And I have promised to bring you out of your misery in Egypt into the land of the Canaanites, Hittites, Amorites, Parasites, Hivites, and Jebusites, the land flowing with milk and honey. The elders of Israel will listen to you. Then you and the elders are to go to the king of Egypt and say to him, the Lord, the God of the Hebrews has met with us. Let us take a three day journey into the wilderness to offer sacrifices to the Lord our God. But I know the king of Egypt will not let you go unless a mighty hand compels him. So I will stretch out my hand and strike the Egyptians with all the wonders that I will perform among them. After that, he will let you go, and I will make the Egyptians favorably disposed towards this people so that when you leave, you will not go empty-handed. Every woman is to ask her neighbor and any woman living in her house for articles of silver and gold and for clothing, which you will put on your sons and daughters, and so you will plunder the Egyptians. If you would... Move back up to verse 14. Verse 14 reads, God said to Moses, I am who I am. This is what you are to say to the Israelites. I am has sent me to you. Now, my per personal favorite reference is that same verse 14 in the King James Version. The King James Version puts it this way. And God said unto Moses, I am that I am. And he said, thus shalt thou say unto the children of Israel, I am has sent you to me. A family, God wants to talk to you this morning. We're going to be extremely conversational today. When you look at that verse 14, and it says God referred to himself as I am that I am. Many people read that verse 14 and they convey it with the tone as if God's being flippant. 
granted, he's God. And we're not going to sit here and try to convince you or even tell you that there are no places in the Bible where God flexes. Flexes his superiority, flexes his might. If you want an example of that, you can go to the latter, latter chapters of the book of Job and see God flexing all over the place. I don't think that is the case here, though. In this case, God has come down to help. God has heard, he's seen, he's observed the misery of the children of Israel in Egypt. And he's come down to help. God has no intent to leave the children of Israel confused about who he is. He has no intent to leave them unsure. He has every motivation to make sure they know exactly who he is. Why? Because he's come to help. So God's objective here is clarity, not confusion. Yes. When God says, I am that I am, that reference, that expression encompasses everything that we have come to teach and preach and shout about in church that God is almighty, he's all-knowing, that he's ever-present, that God is the God that will be whatever you need him to be. All that is true. But once again, I do not believe that that kind of message is what God intends here. The message is very different, and it's a message that I believe each and every one of us needs to grasp. If you would, peek back up to Exodus chapter 3, verse 6. I believe that God's intent in introducing himself as I am that I am is to make sure his introduction is clear, simple, and direct. As a matter of fact, in verse 6, God clearly announces who he is. God says, then he said, this is God introduced himself, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. At this, Moses hid his face because he was afraid to look at God. Therefore, the identity of God as I am that I am is evident. But the question is, is there a message behind the I am reference? Yes, once again, I believe that there is. And for us as a believer, I believe we really need to grasp that message because I think it's fundamental, a fundamental addition to our perspectives as believers. At the core of God's self-introduction is a request. It's a request that the children of Israel think back. It's a request that the children of Israel think back on what they've heard. Think back on what they've learned. Think back on what they've been taught for generation after generation after generation. Think back on who I am. I am that I am, and you should already know of me. He's asking them to think back. Think back of what you've heard and what you've been taught and what you've learned about the God that hovered over the earth when there was nothing. About the God who spoke and there was light out of darkness. The God who created all things. The God who separated the water from the land. The God who formed man out of the dust of the earth and breathed into his nostrils and man became a living soul. Yeah, I'm that guy. Think about the God who looked around and saw everything that he created and said that everything I created is good. But then looked at man and thought, you know what? It's not good for this man to be alone. So I created another speaking spirit, a companion for him, a speaking spirit that was equal to him. And that speaking spirit became woman. I was there 
when the serpent deceived them into doing what I had asked them not to do. I am the one who judged them. I am that I am. I'm the one that sent them out of the Garden of Eden. I'm the one that was there when Adam's son Cain slew his brother Abel. And I judged him. That's me. I was there. I was there, the actual person who said to a man named Noah, I'm going to destroy the earth with the flood because the entire earth is wicked. And for almost or over a year, I took care of Noah, his family, and animals on that ark. When the earth dried and they got out, I made a covenant with Noah. I made a covenant with Noah, and I told him to be fruitful and multiply. In addition, I put a rainbow in the sky. I put a rainbow in the sky as my reminder never to destroy the earth again with a flood. That was me. I'm that God. I am that I am. As a matter of fact, there were some people who decided they wanted to erect a monument, a monument that would go up to heaven in their own honor. But I came down and scrambled their languages. You might be familiar with that place. You now refer to it as Babel. I'm that guy. You know what else I did? I spoke to your father Abraham. Your father Abraham, by the way, when he was named Abram, and I told him to get away from his land, from his kindred, to a place that I would show him, that I'd make his main name great, that I'd make him a great nation. And he and his wife Sarai and nephew Lot left. I am the God who oversaw them when they were in Egypt with their little deception, saying that Sarai was his sister and not his wife. They pulled that more than once. But you know what? I was there. I was there, and I left them there for a short period of time. But then when they left out of there, they left there prosperous. I'm that God. I am that I am. I am the God that when, they, when he split from Lot, I told him, you know what? You're going to have offspring that are like the dust of the earth. I was with Abram when he took over 300 men and he pursued a band of kings that had plundered Sodom and Gomorrah, taking his nephew Lot and all of his possessions with him. I was there when he defeated them. I was the same God that Abram came to when his heart ached for a son. I told him, don't worry about it. I am your shield and your exceeding great reward. I told him, you have a son of your own. And I cut covenant with him that day. And in cutting covenant with him that day, you know what else I did? I spoke to him about the very life that you're living now in your bondage in Egypt. I was there. Remember, think back, I am that I am. I was there when Abram and Sarai decided to get with Hagar and make their own son. It gave birth to Ishmael when Abram was 86 years old. You know what else? What else? I ultimately changed Abram's name to Abraham father of many nations, and I changed Sarai's name to Sarah, mother of many nations. I did all of that. I am that I am. I am the God that spoke into the bodies of two elderly people that seemingly could not have a child, and then Sarah gave birth to Isaac. And Abraham held his son at 100 years old. I'm the guy that told Abraham to take that very son up to the mountain and sacrifice him to me. And right before he sacrificed them, I sent an angel to stop him. And remember the ram in the bush? That was me. I'm that guy. I put that there. I am that I am. Think back. You know me. I am that I am. I am the God who brought to Isaac 
a wife named Rebekah. And in bringing him Rebekah, they had two offspring, one named Esau, one named Jacob. Those two brothers, their relationship went sour when Jacob and his mom devised a plan that allowed their father to give Jacob Esau's blessing. Now, Esau wanted to kill him, but don't worry about that. I made that all work out good. They were hugging by the time I was done, but I'm that guy. I am that I am. While Jacob fled, one evening I showed him a vision of a ladder stretching from earth to the heaven. And just like I had spoken the words to Abraham, just like I had spoken the word to Isaac, I also spoke to Jacob the same words, that I will give you seed that cover the earth. All families of the earth for through you shall be blessed. And more importantly, I said these words to Jacob. I will not leave you until everything I told you will happen has happened. That is me. I am that I am. I'm that guy. That's who I am. You know of me. I was there when Jacob, for 20 years, worked for his uncle Laban. That relationship was really twisted. But you know what? When he came out, he came out with great possessions. And he came out with two wives. One he loved, Rachel, and one he tolerated, Leah. Yes, I'm that guy. I'm the one who blessed Rachel with a son named Joseph, who paved the way for you to be here in Egypt. I'm also the God who blessed Leah with a son named Judah whose offspring will mean more to the world than you'll ever know. I'm that guy. I am the God who gave Joseph the dream, the dream that made his brothers so mad that they sold him into slavery and told his father he was dead. I'm the God that was with him when he went to Potiphar's house. I'm the God that stayed with him through that whole ordeal. Even when he was falsely convicted and put into prison, I'm the God who was there with him. I am that I am. I was the one that gave him the wisdom to interpret Pharaoh's dream. Now they say that Pharaoh made Joseph second in command of Egypt because Joseph was able to interpret his dream. That's not true. Pharaoh didn't put Joseph in that position. I did. Pharaoh was only my instrument. Why? Because I am that I am. All this is the case. And you know of me. I am that I am. I am that I am, and I am everything you have heard about and everything you have been taught. Family, look at the Amplified Classic. Same chapter, Exodus 3, starting in verse 14. The Amplified Classic says, And God says to Moses, I am who I am and what I am, and I will be what I will be. And he said, you shall say to the Israelites, I am has sent me to you. God said also to Moses, this shall you say to the Israelites. Now, once again, he's going to clarify the I am that I am is no mystery. I am the God of your father, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. But then he makes a switch, family. Notice. This you shall say to the Israelites, the Lord, the God of your fathers, of Abraham, of Isaac, and of Jacob, has sent me to you. Here's the switch. This is my name forever. And by this name, I am to be remembered to all generations. He begins off verse 15 by saying the same thing he said in verse 6 and some other areas. He said, listen, 
I am that I am. That's me. I'm the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. But then he says, I am the God, and that's my name forever. And I am the God to be remembered for all generations. In other words, you have heard about my power. You've spent your life learning of me. You've spent your life learning of my ability. You spent your whole life hearing about what I did for Abraham. You spent your whole life hearing about what I did for Isaac. You spent your whole life hearing about what I did for Jacob. You've spent your whole life hearing about what I did. Now the time has come for you to see what I can do. You see, although you have heard of me and you have learned of me for so many years and all your life, for generation after generation, somehow you've allowed yourself to think of me as history. You've allowed yourself to think of me as something in the past. But I'm a current God. I am that I am is my name for generation after generation and forever. It's time for you to become aware of what I can do. It's time for you to get your own relationship with me. It's time for you to refer to me as your God. I'm not just the God of Abraham. I'm not just the God of Isaac. I'm not just the God of Jacob. I'm your God too. And it's time for you to know just as your fathers had me and I supplied them with everything they needed to succeed, I will be all that you ever need. Family, when the children of Israel was to this point, God was asking him to observe who he was, but all they had to work with was from the creation until now. Basically, if we were to look at it in the Bible sense, all they had to work with was the book of Genesis because they're getting ready to live the book of Exodus. And based on that information alone, God is saying, I want you to believe and have comfort in I am that I am. Those folks had only the book of Genesis. Loved ones, you and I have 66 books. For us, it's not just about the book of Genesis. We have 66 books to realize God is the I am. We have 66 books. That means we don't just have what Moses wrote, all the books he wrote. We also have God-inspired, Holy Spirit-inspired writings by Joshua and Samuel and Ezra and David and Solomon and Mordecai and, and Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, Daniel, Hosea, Joel, Amos, Obadiah, Jonah, Micah, Nahum, Habakkuk, Zephaniah, Zach Zechariah, Haggai, Malachi, Matthew, Mark and Peter, John, Luke, Paul, James and Jude. We have all of that to, to rely on, all of that to look at and read about, to know that he is the I am. Plus, we have what they never had, God inside. We have the Holy Spirit on the inside. We have Christ as our Savior. We have more than they ever had to know that God is the I am. And he was asking them to know that from the creation to Genesis. I want you to look at a second slide. God said, I am that I am. Recall family, once again, looking at our foundation. We said that we wanted to take the time to make our fine foundations sure before we start layering on top of it other topics. Topics like love, prayer, salvation, joy, peace, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. 
I want you to know that I've been praying all year long, asking God, when is the right time for us to move above ground? God, when, when is the time come that our foundation has at least been built to a point to where we can benefit from going above ground? And I believe that time is now. I believe that time is now, and I'm going to explain to you why. When you look at those five foundational pieces, God, Jesus, the Holy Spirit, the kingdom of God, and the Bible, you will probably say to yourself, and looking at all of those, we haven't had lessons that specifically address all five by name. But follow me. When we talk about Jesus... If you've been coming here for any length of time, you know we've had extensive discussions about Jesus. We've talked about Jesus and the things that he's done. We've talked about him with the woman at the well, the woman caught in adultery. We've talked about him, the blind man, the man that was born blind, healing that, Lazarus. We've talked about him feeding over 5,000 with two fish and a few pieces of bread. We've talked about that. Not only that, family, there are two times each year that we dedicate our service to Jesus, Easter and Christmas. Plus, when we talked about the Bible, we had a detailed discussion at, on the validity and the divine nature of Jesus' life, crucifixion, and resurrection. So we've talked about Jesus. What about the Holy Spirit? Well, for years, you know that we've talked about the Holy Spirit being the gift that Jesus sent back to us, and he's our helper, helper, our comforter. He's our standby, our strengthener. But what else did we say from the Holy Spirit? We said that the Holy Spirit lives inside of our bodies. Our bodies are what? The temple of the Holy Spirit. And as the temple of the Holy Spirit, we should treat our bodies as temples. So the Holy Spirit, you can put a check by that. What about the kingdom of God? Well, when you think of the kingdom of God, when you think of kingdom, you automatically think of what? A king. And the sheer nature of the name tells you who is the king of the kingdom of God. It's God. We know that Jesus gives us access to that kingdom. Through him, we become joint heirs, joint heirs with Christ. And in addition to that, through that connection, we not only get the Holy Spirit, but all the benefits that comes with being kingdom citizens. That's why we spent so much time on God and the Bible, because between God and the Bible, there are probably the two most least, I should say, talked about items in detail in church and in the body of Christ. So when you look at it that way, family, we're ready to go up top. I want you to focus on slide number three. Let's take some time to talk about what items we want to layer on top of your spiritual foundation. Family, the ministry has series that they've been discussing, discussing throughout this year. Stability was one of them. And stability is what we've been working on. We've been driving in stability. The time has come, though, that we can rise up and start layering in others. What are the series that they've talked through to date? Heroes, and that's not a misspelling. We'll discuss these in a minute. The next series, Not Easily Broken. Think Rich, Live Wealthy, Victory Lap, and The Art of War. As a quick side note, I want you to know, and you've heard me say this before, but it, it goes without saying. No, it goes, I should note it again. You know I've always communicated to you that we're, we're not in the business of teaching anything different here. It may come out different timing. It may come out in a different way, but we're one nation. There's no 
There's no value in ever doing anything along those lines. The time has come, though, for us to delve into those. Now, let me give you a quick, high-level description of each one of those series. Keep in mind that these descriptions are high level and they're not meant to be all encompassing. Heroes. Notice it's spelled like hearing in the ear. H-E-A-R, heroes. The implication behind the spelling is to remove ourselves from the sidelines. To stop waiting for someone else to step into life situations and to become an active participant in life ourselves. Don't sit and wait. Instead, be a Christian who has the mantra of I hear and I do. Do not focus so much on what people or life situations say you can't do. Focus on what God said and do what he instructs you to do. Be a hero. Not easily broken. Living a life of continued mis-expectations can leave you perpetually broken. And often we get into a cycle because we put our trust in people or we set our own expectations. We need to avoid being so easily broken. And to do that, we need to trust in God, trust in his love, and stay away from the trap called unforgiveness. Think rich, live wealthy. There is a difference between thinking rich and living wealthy. Moreover, thinking rich and living wealthy is not narrowly focused just on finances. Rather, it is to do more with wholeness. Having a conviction that you trust in God and resting in the authority of Jesus Christ's resurrection. Moreover, since God is the source of provision and everyday enjoyment, Expect maximum manifestation when you place him in the middle of everything you do. Victory lap. God put the salvation plan in motion. Jesus executed that plan with perfection. And once we accepted him as Lord, Jesus set us in the place of victory. He set us in the place of victory by creating a pathway back to God, giving us the Holy Spirit and providing us access to the kingdom. So we are not striving for victory. We are victorious already. The art of war. One aspect of this series is prayer, but not just casual prayer. We are to pray bigger, pray with confidence, and pray like we know we have dominion. These series also denote also direct us to stick with God no matter how the situation looks and rest in the finished work of Jesus. Now, a quick few notes about how everything that we've touched on this year links in with these series. Just quick notes. This is definitely not going to be extensive. But you know, we jumped off into 2019 saying what? You got to have resolve. You got to have resolve to finish. We got to be these people that finally don't get into next year in the same starting space that you are at this year. Don't be the same person on that roundabout that says, oh, this is what I want to do. This is what God has called me to do. This is what God has called me to be. And in the very next year in the same spot saying the same thing. You need to have resolve to finish. Well, guess what? Having resolve fits into any one of these series. Pastor Greta taught a message about trusting in God. Trusting in God fits into any one of these series. She also spoke about James's conviction. His conviction that says, if you say you're a child of God, 
then God should show up in your everyday walking and talking, living and breathing life. Your life should be a walking expression of God if you say God is on the inside of you. Hey, let me tell you, heroes, I don't know about the other one, but that show enough fits in there. If you are a child of God, whatever God say, we should see you doing. What about the art of war dealing with prayer? And you know prayer weaves through all of these, but we can just point to the foundation. We pray to God in the name of Jesus. And when we don't know what to pray, the Holy Spirit prays for us, giving us utterance. And the kingdom of God is where all of our resources are. Jesus gives us access. And the Bible tells us about all of that. Not only that, family, when we pray, we know to whom we pray to. Why? Our God is Elohim. El Elyon. El Roy. El Shaddai. Jehovah Jireh. Jehovah Rapha. Jehovah Rohi. Jehovah Shema. Jehovah Shalom. Jehovah Makedesh. Jehovah Tiskanu. Jehovah Nisi. We learned all about that. We know who we pray to. That's part of our foundation. And most of all, we know our Father God are all of those characteristics bundled up in one name. It don't matter, remember, it don't matter what you call him. You can call him God, you can call him Father, you can call him Lord, or even if you call him Daddy. Once you make God, once you make the decision to actively Put God in your life. You never get just part of him. Why? Because family, all of God is always on. So, yeah. You are well positioned. For us to start layering things on top of that spiritual foundation. And we're going to start next week with heroes. Chat with you soon. Let's pray. We pray that today's message was a blessing to you. If you would like to help us further expand the vision, simply text the word Give RTM to the number 41444 or visit us online at www.revealingtruth.org. Now remember, Jesus loves you.